Now that we know how traceroute works by using the time to live field, let's look at some examples of traceroute usage. Traceroute is actually, I think, pretty cool. Um, you can probably use this to impress your friends, maybe you meet a life partner, whatever. So, but let's look at some examples of using traceroute. So I'm gonna run traceroute from my Mac right here, which is in my office, it's connected to a wireless router. And let's start with a really simple example. So testify.csc.buffalo.edu, that's my main work machine. It's located right across the hall. So I would expect that there's a very short path between this machine and Testify, but let's see how packets would be routed between those two hosts. And indeed, my intuition was correct. It only takes two hops to get to Testify. So how, do, how does this work? The first hop is to a wireless router that's sitting right over there. That's how this laptop is connected to the internet. Um, then I can immediately get to Testify because this is on a local network that this, the, all these con computers are essentially connected to the same local network. So this is good. Um, this shows you examples of traceroute output. Traceroute shows me the IP addresses. Um, this is the IP address of my work machine, 128.205.39.4. This is a private IP address that's used by this end of the connection that I have to the router. Um, it also shows me the host names here that it was able to look up. So it was able to translate this IP address into this particular host name. That can be kind of interesting because the host names sometimes tell you a little bit about those particular IP addresses. Maybe what, what ISP they're a part of or what part of the internet they're in or whatever. Okay, so let's try a little bit more interesting example. I'm going to launch a trace route to NewYorkTimes.com. Okay, uh, so here's what's happening. You can see that I very quickly am down to 18 hops, which is kind of interesting. Now what's happening, remember, some parts of the internet block the messages the trace route needs to operate. And actually, if I continue to let this run, what I would probably see is that this just is going to go on and on and on because I've reached some part of the network where trace route traffic is not allowed. Um, and so any messages that routers are trying to send back from further down the chain are being blocked by that part of the network. But we can already see some really interesting stuff, so let's go through this. Um, this is the same router that was my first stop on the way to testify across the hall, but then things start to get uh, start to get different. So this now these IP addresses 128.205 these are University at Buffalo IP addresses. So here's one hop in the University of Buffalo. Here's another hop in the University of Buffalo. Another hop. Another hop. Another hop in the University of Buffalo. And now here's the first. IP address right here, 38.122, that's not part of the University at Buffalo Class B um, network, right? It doesn't have the prefix 128.205. So this is new. And this actually is one of the two internet service providers that the University at Buffalo peers with. That's how we get data from our network out into the core internet. And this is um, uh, ISP called Cogent. You can see that the uh, uh, name of this machine sort of identifies it as part of being part of the Cogent network. These names are also sort of interesting. They, they might, <laughs> you might be able to look at these and at least be able to guess where some of these routers on campus are located. But this is the core campus router that my uh, packet goes through right before it exits campus, 128.205.9.105. And that router has chosen to route this packet that's trying to get to NewYorkTimes.com through one of the two ISPs that UB uses. This is Cogent, okay? So, so remember that. Um, okay, and then, uh, and then you can see a bunch of other addresses within Cogent's network. Eventually we get to something that says New York. There's a Newark address here, um, and, and then we could look at the rest of these. But let's launch a different query and see a, a different path, okay? Uh, so let's try doing the same thing, but we're going to do it to ESPN.com. Okay, um, so up until this point, um, we're, we're seeing some, well actually we don't see some similar things. Let's, so this uh, might not uh, terminate either, because again, we've hit some part of the network where they're blocking uh, the ICMP traffic the trace route requires to operate. But here's what's interesting, so some of these hops are the same. I think this hop, this hop, this hop, this hop, this hop. Remember, we get to this core router on campus, 128.205.9.105. What's interesting, is that that router made a different decision this time about which of, U, of UB's two ISPs to send this packet out. So this time I went to 4.59 and this domain name identifies that router as being run by level three. 
So you can use Traceroute, in this case, to notice that UB actually appears with at least two internet service providers. One of them is Level 3, the other one is Cogent. And depending on which site I'm using, uh, UB's internal router is saying it's actually faster if I want to go to ESPN.com to route the packet out across Level 3's uh, uh, autonomous system than it is Cogent's. If I want to go to the New York Times.com, it's faster to use Cogent. So this is an example of using Traceroute. It's a really cool tool. Poke around with it. It's a lot of fun. There are some tools online that you can use to try to uh, create maps of where your Traceroute traffic is going. Those aren't always that useful because we don't know where all of these routers are on the map. But obviously, the packets that I'm sending between here and some website are actually traversing a path in physical space. And it can be cool if you can find one that works to see sort of exactly where those hops are, or at least exactly where we think they are. So have fun using Traceroute. Use it to impress your friends.